Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so there are another few talks coming on afterwards, so I'm not going to try to touch on everything here. Uh, but I'll just touch on a few of the interesting topics that strobecs can do with pulsars, excluding things like uh, the equation of state that's coming up in a, a separate talk later. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about rotation-powered pulsars, looking at the physics of pulsars themselves, rotation-powered pulsars, precision timing, and what that can tell you about the universe, uh, and then looking at thermally emitting pulsars, and again, getting back to the sort of the physics of what's going on in the sources themselves. I'm actually going to do this in reverse order, though. So first, I'll start talking a little bit about these isolated neutron stars are known by a number of different acronyms. Uh, these are bright, cool X-ray sources with very thin optical counterparts. There's currently seven sort of bona fide members with a few more candidates. Um, in general, these are very soft, but quite bright X-ray sources. So peaking at the very soft end of the sort of Chandra or strobe X band, um, but at quite bright uh, count rates, such as they are quite bright in ROSAD. Um, the spin periods are long, three to 10 seconds. Uh, no radio emission. They're very nearby. You know that by half of motions, low intercellular absorption, and in a few cases, direct parallax measurements. And this is a, a, an interesting example that has been the subject of observations for um, a number of years now um, because they're, they're quite bright, so you get pretty high count rates when you look at them. They're relatively young, so you can use them to understand neutron star cooling and understand the various phase transitions that go on in the interior. And the emission is thermal. You're not being dominated by the magnetospheric emission that complicates what you see when you look at most pulsars. So just as an example of that, here's the first one that was discovered, the sort of canonical one of this class. And you see a very thermal X-ray spectrum, maybe a few indications that it's not quite a pure black body, but it's still entirely thermal. And if you look at how much you're getting out in terms of X-ray luminosity, uh, it's far more than the amount of spin-down luminosity that you see, unlike most rotation-powered pulsars. So we've been studying these for a couple of decades now, and I said they have a uh, spin period of 3 to 10 seconds. Unlike some of the sources that I'm going to show you later, the um, pulsations from these sources are rather sinusoidal and gentle with low amplitudes, as low as uh, sort of 1% or even lower in some cases which makes doing uh, timing observations very challenging. Very soft response is needed. It needs lots of time from Chandra and XMM. It has to be spaced out in a way to so maintain phase coherence between different observations. And this was uh, an example of an observation where we took about 150 kiloseconds of XMM observations, and we were unable to get a statistically significant spin-down measurement. Um, nonetheless, we think we have sort of an understanding of what this population is showing us here. And what it's showing us is that this population is all those red circles on the right side there, and they seem to be objects where the um, rotational evolution is coupled with the thermal evolution. So you're seeing coupling between the energy lost to heating and the energy in the magnetic fields. The magnetic fields are decaying over the lifetimes of these objects, which is a few hundred thousand to a few million years. That's making them hotter than they would be otherwise. That's also leading them to a particular part of this PP dot diagram. And that's been studied theoretically by Jose Pons and a number of other collaborators. And these observations, we think, are showing reasonably good evidence for it, although the populations are still quite small, and some of the correlations that we see could certainly just be artifacts of low statistics. Another interesting thing for these objects that needs better investigation is understanding the X-ray spectra. I said they're very largely thermal. Uh, in, when we looked at them in detail to begin with, they were very highly reproduced by black bodies. But when we looked with longer observations, with better telescopes, we saw that there were these broad X-ray absorption features sort of taking chunks out of the X-ray spectrum. And that's something that has sort of eluded a comprehensive understanding uh, for, the, for as, long as, they've been under, as long as they've been seen. These X-ray absorption features vary with pulse phase in a way that we don't really understand. No simple mapping of the types of absorption features that we expect to occur in these objects really makes sense to explain the population. Not a cyclotron line, not an atomic transition, nothing like that. There's no one answer that we can use to give uh, an understanding for the whole population. But again, we're looking at a very small population of objects, just seven, with a wide variation in the observed properties, the temperature, the magnetic field. So looking at this over a larger population, will really help us understand the physics of what's going on, 
the sort of highly magnetized atomic physics, the magnetospheres of these objects, the cooling physics, how does the magnetic field evolve over the lifetimes of these neutron stars? How will that affect our implications for the pulsar population? If we count the young objects, look at what magnetic fields do they have, you project that forward in time, you'll get the wrong answer if you don't account for the evolution of the magnetic field. So this field's been, in my opinion, a little bit stuck for a number of years, but it's about to be busted open by Eurasida. So Eurasida should discover on the order of 100 of these objects, uh, depending on the exact population parameters, but it likely can investigate them in detail, both because of its limited collecting area and because of its mode of operation. The nice thing about these objects, though, is that they're often at high galactic latitudes. They're not like the rotation-powered pulsars that are concentrated in the galactic plane. These things are all over the sky. They're very nearby. So they're not going to have large amounts of contaminating background objects. They're going to be relatively clean for investigation with a facility like Strobex. And what they really need is a lot of soft collecting area. Below 0.3 kV is really where these objects peak. So if you can get a factor of 10 or 20 improvement in the soft collecting area with strobe X, it will really break open the observations of the brighter objects that we've already been investigating that come from the Rosat All Sky Survey, and will make some investigation of the, say, tens to hundreds of objects that the Rosetti will find possible that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So for instance, doing decent X-ray timing, phase resolved timing to get magnetic field estimates for these objects, and understand the population properties. How are the X-ray uh, magnetic fields distributed? Do they all sort of converge in one part of the PV dot diagram, as you'd infer if you had this magnetothermal evolution, or we, are we just sort of imposing wishful thinking on it? Just as, as an example, you need something like one to 200 kiloseconds of XMM to look at these objects that have about 0.05 counts per second in ROSAT, and that's just because the pulsations are relatively weak and quite broad. But if you can bump that up, with strobe X, you can look at sources that are a factor of 10 or 20 fainter in comparable observing times, or look at the bright sources in much less time. Also, sort of CCD resolution spectroscopy. For the most part, we've been happy with CCD resolution spectroscopy for studying these objects. There are a few objects that show features in their X-ray spectra that really want grading resolution, but CCDs do a very good amount. And to do high significance phase result spectroscopy to try to understand how these X-ray absorption features vary over the pulse phase. Um, we really haven't been able to make any strong conclusions out of it. There's been some limited modeling coming out of some other people, um, but the sort of numbers of objects and the degrees of freedom are too unconstraining right now. So what we really need is many more objects with many fewer degrees of freedom. And then understanding statistics through observations of the population, log n, log s, ISM absorptions to get proxy distances and things like that. You won't be able to get parallax for the majority of these objects, but you can still build up indirect inferences to understand how many of them are there and what does that infer about their progenitor populations, what does that infer about what they could turn into. And another potential thing that strobex may make possible is these objects are very nearby, they have very high proper motions, it may be possible over uh, sort of a five plus year baseline for the mission, I don't actually know what's being considered, uh, to do some proper motion measurements using X-ray timing. So it certainly won't be possible using imaging astrometry, and I have to run the numbers to make sure it makes sense for objects with these long spin periods, but that would be another way to get kinematics that gives you some indication of the kinematic ages, you can trace them back, potential birth locations, get ages that you can then combine with their cooling properties. It's also important to look at transition objects, radio pulsars that bridge the populations of these two, uh, of these various classes. So just going back to, sorry, the uh, PV dot diagram here, there's the yellow circle there. That's sort of an object that is currently emitting as a radio pulsar, but it looks like it might be evolving into one of these objects. As its magnetic field winds down, it will turn just into a cooling object. Or something that you might see from a different angle would again look just like a cooling object. So looking at these as they come out of ongoing radio pulsar surveys, pulsar surveys are notoriously difficult to find long period objects. They often get confused with interference, but they are coming out, and as we find more of them, soft X-ray observations are gonna help us understand their properties and relate them to these other subpopulations. Um, the main challenge is gonna be competing with uh, dedicated missions like Athena that have this in their main science case, 
will all of the good science have been done? Can strobex compete in some aspect of parameter space, say doing more observations of faint sources at lower significance, or something like that? Another sort of transition object that's worth looking at with strobex are things like Calvera. This is an object that was originally thought to be one of the populations that I showed you before, but instead of having a long spin period in a, a high magnetic field, it instead has a rather short intermediate spin period somewhere between very young pulsars and older pulsars. Um, we think this could be uh, a number of different populations. It, it's quite nearby, but we don't really know what's going on with it. So understanding strobex follow-up of promising erosive sources to discover pulsations and figure out in which populational box do they lie will help us understand, is this just a really odd one-off object, or is it the tip of some underlying population iceberg? A separate topic is understanding the nanohertz gravitational wave background from supermassive black holes as measured through pulsar timing. This is a project that a number of us in this room are part of through the Nanograph collaboration, and there are also international analogs uh, in Europe and Australia and then internationally. So currently our program is that we time tens of millisecond pulsars with radio telescopes. We time them every week, two months, and we assemble very high quality um, timing measurements of these objects and look at the residuals to understand is there an underlying joint background coming from a population of supermassive black hole binaries that are orbiting around each other in the distant universe. So one of the main limiting systematic effects for these observations is coming because they're radio observations from the medium through which the radio waves propagate. So the ionized interstellar medium and the homogeneity interstellar medium introduce noise into our observations. And we're doing a number of things to mitigate this, looking at multiple radio frequencies at once, timing uh, space and there are alterations out closer together and various things like that. But at some point, we may be limited by propagation effect systematics. Other observations are just limited by the available telescope time. We would take up more time if we could. But there are these various noise sources that we're still competing with here, and we don't yet know what will set the ultimate floor to our sensitivity in these observations. But already, we are putting constraints on, on models of supermassive binary black hole evolution. We can say that many of the simplistic models where the supermassive binary black holes are evolving together just under the influence of gravitational waves is not the case, at least for circular orbits. You need something else like eccentric orbits or additional objects coming through the environment taking away angular momentum. Something else is going on. We're still at work figuring out what it is. Actually, right now, we're mostly at work trying to figure out what's going on with the solar system ephemeris, but I think that's almost resolved, and then we'll get back to doing more astrophysics. So we're looking at these millisecond pulsars that are the most precise objects we can time, um, but we also might want to look at those objects at other wavelengths too. So just to briefly divert, when we look at the types of pulsar emission that we see in the x-rays, we see two different classes of emission. We see non-thermal emission coming from the magnetosphere. This emission actually spans everywhere from the radios through the gamma rays, and it's quite visible in the X-rays uh, for a number of objects. You typically get very sharp pulsations that make good timing measurements, although the objects themselves are noisy. In contrast, you can have thermal emission coming just from the hot surface of the, of the neutron stars. There you're seeing emission that's peaking in the ultraviolet or soft X-rays. You're seeing a large fraction of the neutron star surface. That means that the pulsations are very gentle and sinusoidal, so they have a large width, which means that you get uh, poor, um, poor timing precision. So if you're looking at doing an X-ray timing array, the non-thermal pulsars have very sharp profiles that would lend themselves to making this uh, a good observation. But there are only a few of these that are known, and they also tend to be very noisy rotators on their own. So they're, they're just not great objects for timing them in the x-rays. There are a number more of these objects that have these smooth, gentle pulsations, um, but, and they're very stable rotators, but the fact that their pulsations are relatively broad means that we don't get very good intrinsic precision when we measure them. So then the question is, okay, this is what we're doing right now in the radio. This is what the x-ray could offer us. Where would the x-ray meet us 
in the radio, if we keep on with our radio program, if we could pull Strobeck together and have it together with the radio program in 10, 15 years. So what our hope is, is that the radio observations alone will lead to a detection of the stochastic background within the next few years, roughly by 2020 or so. So the 2030 regime will really be the era of continuous wave observations characterizing individual supermassive black hole binary sources through detailed observations. And that puts you in a different source regime for the types of sources that you really want to find. Um, what you really want is to look at individual, really well-timable pulsars. Right now, we need a lot of pulsars that we time really often. Uh, because in the stochastic background, we're really dominated by the sum over pairs of some number that is a weak power of the timing precision. So the timing precision for individual pulsars doesn't matter hugely. We can really just want as large numbers of them, and there's a factor in there for the cadence and things like that that I've left out. So you want a lot of pulsars that you observe very often. But when you move to continuous wave regime in the future, it's really just looking at something like a uh, a um, sum of the, uh, uh, the RMS for the best individual sources. So the best individual sources will really dominate that sum on the bottom there. So instead of having tens or hundreds of sources that we're timing now at modest precision, you might be able to get away with just having a smaller number, say 10 objects that you time with really phenomenal precision. And that would give you all the observations you need to understand the, uh, the individual supermassive black hole binaries that you want to find. So this factor here might be able to save us, even though there are not that many really bright X-ray MSPs with really fantastic timing properties. And timing in other wavelengths is really great because you don't have these propagation effects. You're limited instead by photon statistics. So there's been a lot of nice work on this by Scott Ransom looking at Fermi, and now looking with NICER at doing various tests and developing software packages. So here are a couple of examples that Scott gave me from a talk that I'm sure most of you saw last month. Um, but you could do really good work where the uh, timing precision in X-rays and gamma rays for some of the good pulsars can be just as good as the data in the radio. So are there enough good pulsars? So in the radio right now, we're timing, uh, say, tens of pulsars. The best precision uh, that we're getting right now is about 50 nanoseconds. And the worst, I should say one microsecond, not one nanosecond. So the best ones are about 50 nanoseconds. The worst that we bother our time are about one microsecond. We observe them every week for the best ones, every month for the poor ones. And it takes roughly half hour to an hour per radio telescope observation to get one of these measurements. So how might this scale in the future if you take something like Strobex scaling from intermediate results with NICER? So you have 100 kilosecond nominal exposure. The best Q sources will give you a precision of on the order of 20 nanoseconds, which is quite good. It's better than we're doing the radio right now. But those sources are the ones that are not intrinsically stable rotators. Most of the ones that you'll see are actually going to be more in the few hundred nanoseconds to one microsecond regime. And there are only tens of millisecond pulsars that we know of that have pulsations that we can detect right now. We might be able to find many more of these with something like Erosida, but they're not going to be very bright. So this is just a rough population uh, plot that I put together earlier, uh, just showing the RMS, uh, the number of pulsars with a given RMS. You can see that most of them are at a couple hundred nanoseconds. So it's saying that, well, these pulsars might be able to factor into the pulsar timing game now, in 2017. Hopefully, in 2027, we've moved well past this regime. And so there may just not be enough of these good X-ray timeable millisecond pulsars. But I think we'll learn a lot with ongoing observations with NICER, and we'll have to see what Strobex and other new multi wavelength missions can find. There may be a new population there that we just don't appreciate. So there are a couple other topics that I just want to mention. Some of them were already covered um, today, so I took them out, which is good because I've run out of time. Um, so looking at the red back millisecond pulsars, so we heard earlier about transitional millisecond pulsars, uh, and some of these objects. We can also do additional studies of the shock in the binary system. So when the pulsar is in the pulsar state, not once in the accreting state, you can use the X-ray observations to study the shock regime between the pulsar and the um, and the uh, and its companion. 
And that helps you understand the nature of the pulsar emission and the nature of astrophysical shocks. Um, I had a couple of more slides on these objects, but I took them out given the talks earlier today. So I'll just conclude with just sort of a list of other ideas, and there are many, many more ideas um, that a number of people have come up with, uh, just at, at the level of, here are cool things we could do with pulsars if we had a whole lot more collecting area. So looking at the cooling of young neutron stars, understanding the residual heat versus ongoing heating from various mechanisms, magnetic field and otherwise, uh, probe magnetic field decay, try to understand the microphysics. Um, will extra timing complement radio efforts? There may not be enough bright sources. What I've really not talked about a lot is all the emission physics that you get from studying the pulsar magnetospheres themselves, looking at how bright are the x-rays, how do the x-rays compare with gamma rays with other wavelengths, can you compare the features in the uh, pulse profiles with features at other wavelengths to understand where the particles are accelerated, even just the bulk energetics are a source of endless fascination. Uh, here's a plot showing the uh, spin-down energy luminosity on the x-axis and the x-ray luminosity on the y-axis uh, with a number of potential models for what could give rise to this observed correlation. And you see that all the models are pretty crap. Uh, there are, are pretty bad uncertainties there in terms of the pulsar distances that may improve over the next 10 years if we can get SKA to do astrometric and timing observations. But trying to understand what gives rise to this correlation um, will be very interesting. But again, there just aren't a lot of really bright, phenomenally timable X-ray pulsars. Um, and uh, there are other things you could do. You can look at the equation of state. We'll be here about that in a second. Uh, Intrabinary shocks. Um, an area that I think is really going to be interesting is looking at searches over the next decades. There are a lot of missions and ground-based telescopes that have discovered a lot of interesting compact object sources, but where the definitive identification won't come until you find pulsations and know what's going on. We heard about this earlier today with the ULSs as well. So there are more unidentified Fermi sources. You're is going to find many unidentified sources. Radio imaging experiments like the VLA Sky Survey and SKA will find many pulsar-like observations, but they won't be able to necessarily discover pulsations. So if you can look in the x-rays, you can use that to help figure out which of these objects are which types of objects, and then go from there to understand the underlying physics. Um, I think at this, at the Strobex machine, we're really going to have to focus as well on objects that are uh, transitional or um, changing in nature, because the hope is eventually that FKA2 will discover all of the nearby pulsars that have radio emission. So we're really just going to have to focus on things where the FKA sky coverage won't have been enough to capture things that are switching between these various states. Um, but I just wanted to close this with the title of a paper that my student wrote recently, um, which is showing that even when you have really interesting radio pulsars that show some really phenomenal properties, so one of these is extraordinarily bright, it's in a triple system, we're timing it every day with various radio telescopes, it comes up with a, a 10 count blip in XMM, really not interesting at all. So, but the converse of this is also true, that things that may look very boring in the radio may be really interesting in X-rays. So extrapolating from the population we know now to what might be observable with Strobex uh, may have some surprises in store. <laughs>